Now, Sevan Dagdalen has been a member of the German Bundestag for nearly 20 years. She's the chairwoman of the parliamentary group of Die Linke in the Committee on Foreign Affairs of the German Bundestag and spokeswoman for international relations and disarmament of the parliamentary group of Die Linke. She is a member of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly and a substitute member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, Deputy Chairwoman of the German-Chinese Parliamentary Friendship Group, German-Indian Parliamentary Friendship Group, and German-US Parliamentary Friendship Group. So she can get on with pretty much everyone by the sound of things. But she's amazing. I've spoken with her in London, and we're so happy that she's taken the time out to join us here today. Thank you so much, Claire, dear Claire, uh, dear Mick, dear friends. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for this event. The war in Ukraine is claiming lives each and every day. In Germany, we have so-called military experts, such as Florence Gaub, the director of research division at the NATO Defense College in Italy, who have publicly declared very lately that we shouldn't advocate for a ceasefire or for peace negotiations because conflicts have their internal clock. And only when it has run out is a ceasefire possible. Our response to these cynics of power is that, no, this war must end, and it must end immediately. We need an immediate ceasefire without preconditions and a diplomatic solution in Ukraine. And let me, let me say quite clearly that those who want to make this contingent on prior commitments by either of the warring, warring parties just want this war to continue. And this madness must be stopped. And it appears that an agreement was on the table in March 2022. And it's disgrace, that's a disgrace, that the then conservative UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, in cahoots with the US administration, prevented a deal from being reached. So let's take a close look at what's happening now. The war in Ukraine has turned into a dangerous NATO proxy war against Russia. And this war has the potential to escalate, also thanks to the supply of more and more and increasingly heavy weapons. Anyone who wants to prevent a nuclear war in Europe must stand up to this escalation. And apparently there is more at stake here that NATO countries are crossing the line from non belligerent to belligerent parties in this war. They are doing this in the form of cooperation between intelligence services by advising and coordinating liaison officers on the ground, by exchanging technical and tactical expertise, and by comparing situational pictures to the point of joint situation planning and training Ukrainian soldiers on the use of Western weapons on a massive scale. The recent attacks with British Storm's shadow missiles represent a fresh escalation in this regard. This spiral of escalation must be stopped. The supplies of weapons to the war zone must be stopped. Brazil, China, and six African countries have launched peace initiatives and traveled to Kiev and Moscow. Why isn't this being supported in Washington in Berlin, in London, or even in Dublin. I often hear people... I often hear people ask what the problem, what the, the problem with NATO is since, or so they argue it is a purely defense alliance. But anyone who claims that NATO is a purely defense alliance either isn't familiar with the history of the military pact or is knowingly lying to the public. Didn't NATO wage 
war in Afghanistan for 20 years? Didn't NATO invade Yugoslavia in 1999 without a mandate from the UN Security Council? Didn't NATO wage a murderous war to implement regime change in Libya in 2011 in violation of a UN Security Council resolution? And wasn't it NATO that, despite promises to the contrary, continued to expand further and further east right up to Russia's border, border? Wasn't it NATO that, back in 2014, committed itself to a gigantic, gigantic rearmament program, program with the 2% target? No, dear friends, NATO is a warfare alliance. Anyone who accedes to its party to murder and manslaughter as well as the violations of international law, and that's why it should be dissolved, the NATO. And that's why... <laughs> and that's why, also against the backdrop of, of its proxy war in Ukraine, I have called Germany's withdrawal from this military pact and for the withdrawal of the US soldiers after 70 years, it's about time that they go home, that they leave the country, and that they take their... <laughs> and that they take their nuclear weapons with them. And then I've heard the argument that NATO is an alliance of democracies against autocrats. So it's really amazing that no one is remotely ashamed of propagating such high-grade nonsense. This argument is historically false. NATO never had a problem with fascist dictatorships as members, as in the case of Portugal under Salazar, or in the case of Greece following the military coup. And today, it has no problem with the autocrat Erdogan or the fascist Meloni in Italy. But those who enter into pacts with autocrats should please stop claiming that this is the question of democracy and human rights. And when German tanks are rolling into battle against Russia right now, and the German government, in response to my questions, cannot even rule out the possibility of NATO's weapons ending up in the hands of Russian neo-Nazi groups, who are now evidently carrying out attacks against Russia with the support of Ukraine, then we must be worried. We have seen with ISIS in Syria what a Frankenstein monster created by the West is capable of doing. This policy is despicable. A few days ago, the European Union adopted its 11th package on, of sanctions against Russia. This time around, extraterritorial sanctions are set to be imposed on third parties, the first time ever. Brussels is not only at risk of becoming a party to the war itself by providing military aid on a massive scale and training soldiers. By doing this, the European Union is also intensifying its self-destructive economic war. While the Russian economy is growing by 2%, Germany is hurtling into recession, and the European Union will soon follow suit. More and more people can no longer afford the skyrocketing prices and fo on food and energy. The combination of a gigantic rearmament program to the tune of more than 1.1 trillion US dollars by the NATO and the European Union countries this year from which only the shareholders of the arms industry, of the military industrial complex, and a self-destructive economic war is poison for our societies. And that's why this madness must be stopped too. Dear friends, neutrality is a very precious commodity these days. After all, only those who preserve their neutrality also preserve their democratic sovereignty. A government of the people, 
by the people. Many countries in the global south are having to witness right now how the NATO countries are unwilling to accept their neutrality, but want to force them, the countries of the global south, to force them to sign up to the economic war and the deliveries of weapons. In a kind of neocolonialism, they want to tell the countries of the global south what to do. The most recent example of this is the right-wing pro-NATO government of Finland, which wants to cut off development assistance to African countries that it considers to be too pro-Russian on the basis of how they cast their votes in the United Nations General Assembly. Ireland has a long history of fighting for independence against colonial oppression, of which everyone here can be justifiably proud. Neutrality is at the heart of its hard-fought independence. To defend neutrality, also in this day and age, is to defend freedom, justice, and democracy itself. You have, my friends, our solidarity in this so very important struggle. Let us stand together against this war and against this escalation for an immediate ceasefire in Ukraine for peace negotiation, and let's win the peace and not the war. Thank you.